All right, Getting to Know You God, that's the uh, title of our uh, series, kind of a shortened series that we're having here. This is lesson number two in this uh, series, uh, entitled The Character of God, Holiness. So let's do a bit of a review of what we've been talking about so far in this series. <clears throat> So in our first lesson entitled uh, Getting to Know You, God, I talked about the need to acquire a better personal knowledge of the God that we pray to, the God that we, you know, we're gathered here today to offer worship to, and also the God that we depend on for our, for our existence. And the main idea was to get to know God from an emotional perspective, you know, from the guts, and not just from the brain. You know, we tend to try to know God simply intellectually and we intellectualize a lot of things. Uh, and this series is to help us to know God a little bit also from the emotions. You know, when you get married, you love the person that you marry, not just intellectually, fine person, good character, you know, so on and so forth, but you also have a feeling about that person. And so in order to know God you know, completely, I believe you have to know him not only intellectually but emotionally as well. If we, you know, we have emotion because he has emotion. We're created in his image. And so we have to know him on that level uh, as well. So we talked about the various images that the Bible writers used to describe a being that was spiritual but who needed to be understood by humans because God is not human. And so the Bible is filled with physical and human images of God to help us relate to Him. Now God is not, remember we said last time, God is not a he, he's not a she, he's not even an it. But the Bible uses these he, she, it type of images to help us understand a being that encompasses all of these as well as the nature of the spirit world that we don't understand at all. So how does a, how does a spirit being you know, allow himself to be known by human beings. Well, he has to give them human images. So in the end, God used, for example, the person of a man, Jesus of Nazareth, to reveal his nature and will to mankind in a way that was complete and understandable to human beings. Now, even with this revelation, there remains certain types of misunderstandings. So in this and in the next couple of lessons, I want to explore with you some of the myths about God's character in person that hinder us many times from knowing Him more perfectly, knowing who He, who he really is. One such false idea is that God wants us to be afraid of Him. Now the confusion here is that we have a misunderstanding of God's position and how He uses His position. In every, instance, <clears throat> excuse me, in every instance where man comes into direct contact with God, man is afraid. You ever notice that? You know, Job, after hearing the, um, uh, after seeing okay, God, uh, writes, behold, I am ins insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. And then in um, uh, Habakkuk, uh, or Habakkuk if you wish, uh, let me get that one up. Uh, here the prophet says, I heard and my inward parts trembled at the sound, my lips quivered, decay enters my bones and in my place I tremble because I must wait quietly for the uh, day of distress for the people to arise who will invade us. Then one other one in Revelation 1.17 says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. So these men uh, were afraid. They were overwhelmed at their meeting with God, but it wasn't a fear of violence. It wasn't a fear of injustice or aggression like we feel when confronted by something or someone more powerful than we are. It was a, a fear or an awe or respect that they felt in the presence of one so great, so majestic, so awesome that they couldn't take it all in at once. 
And one example that I use, and it's a very poor example, but it gives us, imagine you have a thimble, you know what a thimble is, on this side, and then you have a gallon of water on this side. And you begin pouring the water into the thimble. Well, you know that that thimble is going to fill up pretty quick, right? And there's still plenty here. The thimble just cannot take in all of the water in the gallon jug. Well, again, not the best example, but that's what's happening here. When man meets God, when man even sees an angel, never mind in the presence of God, even in the presence of an angel, a spirit being, overwhelmed, they're overwhelmed. The first thing they do is they fall down on the ground, they, they put their face down to the ground. So in actually seeing God, they saw an actual difference between themselves and God. They could actually, in a way, in a moment, they could actually take a, a, a measure of His greatness against their smallness, and they were humbled into reverence by the experience. It was one of the ideas behind the architects of the old cathedrals in Europe. You know, the church buildings, the Catholic church buildings. You know, why? They would take decades to build. Today, you know, we want to build a, a church building, boy, we call the contractor, in May and we're, we're, wanting this, we're wanting this baby to be done by September, you know, or maybe you know, within six months. We've got a deadline, we're going to build the building, we, got, we want everything in there. In the Middle Ages, <laughs> it wasn't days, months, years, it was decades, decades, some centuries to build these huge buildings. And they didn't have, obviously, the, the, uh, the tools and so on and so forth that we have today. But what was the idea behind that? The idea behind building these magnificent buildings with the magnificent art and, 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 and statues and all that stuff was to give the worshiper a sense of awe. You'd walk in, if you've ever visited these things, you walk in and the first thing you do, you don't fall on the ground, but the first thing you do is you look up. Wow, look, look at that dome. You know, it's you know, maybe 200 feet up. 20 stories high. And, and the feeling that you had, the idea was to give the worshiper a sense of awe, a sense of otherworldliness. Now with the Protestant Reformation, when that came along, one of the first things that the reformers did is they took over some of these buildings and they took down the statues, they scrubbed the frescoes off the walls, all the paintings, all of that, and they went to a more minimalist idea, and we're inheritors of that. Our church buildings are rather simple and minimalist, right? Not too much fancy stuff. That comes from that idea of, you know, we believe the, the awe of, of God is seen in the Bible, not in the building. So there are a lot of words that are used to describe this greatness or this majesty of God. Uh, the, uh, the otherness of God, or the transcendency of God, or that He is sovereign, or He is awesome, or He is mysterious. But the word that the Bible uses the most often to describe God is holy, the word holy. In the Old Testament, God is referred to quite often as the Holy One of Israel. But most often, this word holy to refer to God is used by Isaiah in his book. Isaiah could use this term with accuracy because he came face to face with God and describes the experience of his vision, a vision where he caught a glimpse of God's awesomeness, of God's holiness. Now, a little background on Isaiah. Isaiah had been the counselor to many kings on earth. Uh, several kings went through and he was their counselor, if you wish. Um, but in 742 BC, after the death of one of these kings, King Uzziah, Isaiah enters into the temple and as he writes, he sees another king, he has a vision. He sees another king, one who sits on a heavenly throne. And in his description of the scene, he says that he is high and exalted and the train of his robe filled the temple. In those days, the kings, earthly kings, would wear these robes and there would be a train behind them, right? And the longer the train, the more majestic the king. And so when the king, you know, an earthly king would come in with his robe, there'd be two or three attendants you know, holding the train behind him you know, as he walked and he went to 
the throne. That's where we get our, our tradition of the wedding dress with the train. Where does that come from? Well, she's a queen for a day. She has a train. She has attendants. This whole idea comes from that. Well, when Isaiah sees the king, he says the king that he sees on his throne, God, his train, he said, fills the temple. That's how, you know, for, for, for the sake of other words, that's how majestic this king is. Um, above the king, he says in his description, hover angelic beings called seraphs. Now in Egypt, the seraphs would watch over the king to protect him in their uh, religion. But in Isaiah's vision, the angels have to use four of their six wings to protect themselves. And that's because God doesn't need protection. Isaiah hears them calling out to one another and they're saying, holy, holy, holy. Why? Why not just holy and holy? Why not just holy one time? Well, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Isaiah 6.3. So in this scene, the prophet sees himself for what he really is, an impure and weak man in comparison with this majestic scene. I'm an unclean man with unclean lips, right? Isaiah says. And then if we continue the story, it's only when a coal is taken from the altar and used to purge his lips is Isaiah able to stand and respond to the, the call for service. So this same scene is repeated in the vision that John the Apostle has in describing his own presence in God's, um, in, in God's throne room. John says that in the center around the throne were four living creatures and they cover their eyes front and back. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and eyes that covered, their, uh, covered them everywhere and day and night and they never stopped saying what? Holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Romans chapter uh, uh, four, verse six. So in these and other heavenly scenes, God is seen as holy and man's natural reaction is fear and reverence and awe, awe is respect, in the presence of such majesty. There's nothing you can do. You're there, you're just, you're frozen on the spot. This, however, doesn't need to be fear of God as in terror or worry or panic. It's not that they panic. It's not that they're afraid that they're going to be harmed. They just kind of shrivel up, you know, because they see something so majestic that it makes their own being, their own selves, so small. Don't you feel that sometimes? You, you know, you're, um, you're, in, you're, with your, you're going to college, let's say, and, and, you're, and you're with one of your professors, and uh, you think you know something until your professor starts talking and starts teaching and you, you realize, wow, this guy. You, you, don't, you don't even feel comfortable talking with your teacher about the topic because you realize you know so little and he or she knows so much. You know, or in sports, right? Aren't we in awe of people who have you know, uh, special athletic abilities? We applaud them and so, and then if we ever get to meet them, we're kind of nervous. Imagine if Tiger Woods said to any, well, any golfers out there, hey, you know, Mike, for, for example, you want to come and play around with me? Let's go play together. I would say, no, thank you. And you know, when I play golf and I pray, God, you know, what's wrong? What am I doing wrong? An angel appears to me and says, well, Michael, you're just not very good. You, know, you need to stop bothering me with prayer and practice. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, I wouldn't want to be in the same foursome with Tiger Woods because what? It would show how bad I am. Well, there you've got just a little tiny example of what it feels like to be in the presence of God. So in these and other heavenly scenes, God is seen as holy, and as I say, man's natural reaction is reverence and awe. Now, this, however, doesn't need to be fear of God, as in terror, as I said. This fear should be a healthy and respectful reverence 
for a being who is in every way greater than we are. Not greater for the purpose of hurting us, which is the case with human sinful power. We're afraid of people who have way too much power. Why? Because <laughs> we know what human beings can do. And we know what human beings who acquire a lot of power do. Well, what do they do? Well, they put into subjection the weaker ones. That's why in our country, it's good to live in our country because we have a system of checks and balances where nobody can arise to have this kind of totalitarian power to, to be able to rule over everybody. We don't like kings and queens in, uh, in the United States, do we? we don't, that's not the system that we that we want here. But the greatness of God that we recognize, greater for the purpose of encouraging reverence and obedience and love from us. So God's greatness shouldn't inspire naked fear from us, it should provoke a desire to serve Him, and here's my point, provoke a desire to be like Him. Another passage of scripture, 1 Peter 1.16, Peter says, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And so His holiness should engender our holiness. So if I come in contact with God, if I get a vision of God in some way through His word, the, thing, the way it should affect me is I want to be like that. Not I'm afraid of that and I want to run away from that. No, I, I want to be like that. I want some of that for myself. Now the reason God wants us to be holy is that being like Him is the best way to really know Him. I'm going to repeat that, important idea. The reason God wants us to be holy is that being like Him is the best way to really know Him. So to view His holiness should not result in frightening us, but rather encourage us to imitate Him. Of course, if we are to imitate Him in His holiness, we need to understand what His holiness is. So the holiness of God has two distinct features. Number one, separation. When the Bible talks about a holy day, for example, it means that this day has been set apart or designated for a special purpose. In a similar way, God's holiness implies that He is separate. He is special. He is separate from the creation in that He exists in another dimension. He exists outside of the creation. You know this business, you know, God is in me and I am in God and God is in the tree and I'm the tree and the tree is me. No, that's paganism. God is a separate entity. In the beginning, God, over here, created the heavens and earth over there. He isn't one with the earth and the heavens. He's not one. He, he is the creator. The heavens and the earth can just stop existing altogether and He continues to exist. Okay? He is separate from creation in that He exists in another dimension, if you wish. He is not human in nature, although man has similarities to God, created in His image. And God is not who or where we are. We may be like God, but we never say that God is like us. <laughs> so to be holy, therefore, is to be separate from what is around you. So God's holiness is His uniqueness, His state apart from us and the world that we live in. So in our effort to be like God, to be holy, we must also be separate and where He is. So to be holy, you have to be where God is. So far so good? So many have tried to achieve this holiness by going off you know, to a secret place or a quiet place or living a reclusive life thinking you know, I'll just separate myself and I'll just be by myself, it won't, I won't talk or whatever. Many have attempted a holy life by living in a manufactured separate state as hermits or monks 
Or perhaps, you know, I don't cut my hair, I don't wear buttons, I don't, you know what I'm saying? We don't drive cars, you know, we're going we're to create a state of being and just stay in that state of being. We're going to, uh, uh, we're going to shun modernity, you know, no new inventions, nothing. We're going we're to flash freeze a, a, time, a period of time in history and we're going to live within that box and somehow that will <laughs> enable holiness because we've created a separate state than what is a normal state. But the key to being separate or being holy is to go to the place where God is, not create some sort of holy place for ourselves. For example, if we want to go where God is, then we must go to His word. Why? Because that's where He is. See what I'm saying? When you're, in his, when you're in God's word, you're where God is. We must go to our knees in prayer, why? Because that's where God is, hearing prayers. Now, I, please don't get me wrong about the knees, it's an expression. Some people pray on their knees, other people pray sitting down, whatever, I'm not making that necessity here. The idea I'm saying is when you are in the state of prayer, then you, you are, and your spirit, you are where God is. That's where He is. We must go to worship Him. Why? Because when we are gathered in His name, He's there with us. We must go into the battle against our own sins and the sins of the world. And when we do, what do we do? What do we find rather? We find the Spirit of God waging war there. We must go into all the world and preach the gospel. Why? Because He promises that He will always be with us in this effort, right? Doesn't He say that? And lo, I will always be with you until the end of the age. When I preach the gospel, when I am doing that task, when I am sharing, when I am making the effort supporting the, the spread of the gospel, I am in the place of labor where God is. So a holy God is in these places and we find Him and we imitate Him and we get to know Him when we separate ourselves from this world and go where He is and where He calls us to be. Okay, a second distinct feature of God's holiness. So the first one is He's separate from all these things. And if we want to be separate, we have to go where He's at, in the Word, in prayer, in, you know, in worship. The second element, absolute purity. The first is separateness, the second is absolute purity. Remember the two facets of His holiness? God is completely and absolutely pure. This means that He does not and cannot sin. Sin is a problem that infects humans, not God. So every thought, every intention, every action of God is pure from beginning to end. And this purity is at times described in terms of moral perfection, but this is more to show how different God is from man. Even if there was no sin in existence, God's holiness would still be described in terms of purity. A more accurate image is that of light. Isaiah referred to God as the light of Israel in speaking of God's holiness, Isaiah 10, 17, I believe. Jesus said, I am the light of the world in speaking of His essence and purity, John 8, 12. Paul says that the Lord dwells in unapproachable light, 1 Timothy 6, 16. So it's not that God reflects light or He needs light, it's that He is the source of light. He gives off light. Not the dim light created by a mixture of physical elements doomed to eventually burn itself out here in this world. 
His is the light of absolute reality, absolute truth, absolute power, absolute purity. These things create this light. And we use the word light because it's the word that comes closest to describing His purity. Paul tells us to walk as children of light, Ephesians 5.8. And when we do, we tap into that reality, we tap into that truth, we tap into that power. It's the glimpse of that light and that purity that fills our dark minds and hearts with hope and reveals the true darkness of this world. You know, if our quest is to be like God, then this quest must include an effort at purity. What does Jesus say? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. See what he's getting at here? Matthew 5 eight. Those who want to know God never take sin lightly. Every sin is an affront to God. Every sin threatens our relationship with God. And so Purity means that we don't make excuses for our sins or we don't tolerate it within ourselves. And purity requires us to be at war with sin so that the blood of Jesus can continually purify us and allow us to stand in the presence of a holy God, a God of light. So when God seems you know, far away, when our relationship with Him seems dry and tasteless, Perhaps the reason is that we're not where He is or we're not acting how He acts. There's no, there's no satisfaction in Christianity. There's no emotional, you know, what I'm talking about here is emotion. There's no feeling of Christianity unless we're separate from the world. Because if we're not separate from the world, the things that we feel are the world feelings what the world feels. If we, want to, if we want to have the feeling that comes from knowing God, then we need to separate ourselves and be where He is, because that's where those, quote, feelings are available. If we want to uh, be those that actually give off light, then we have to you know, strive for purity, because every sin obstructs the light. That's why we you know, God is not trying to get us to not have fun. <laughs> you know, some, it's usually a, a very immature view of Christianity is that, well, you know, why doesn't God let me have some fun, get out and get drunk and crazy? You know, I'm, no. <laughs> God wants us to know the energizing power of giving off light. We can't give off light if we're buried under sin. That's the reason. So it's a sad thing you know, that people are simply afraid of God. That, that was the, my uh, first point that I made uh, at the beginning. Uh, that kind of fear is a sign that they may know that God is there, but they don't really know the God that is there. But God doesn't want us to be afraid of Him. He wants us to know Him and be like Him. That's what He wants. And what does that being like Him mean? Well, set apart where He is. Clean and pure and full of light as He is. What do you think heaven is like? Heaven is not like here. Heaven doesn't you know, offer the same, doesn't offer carnal pleasure other religions promise that. In Islam, you know, the promise of 72 virgins you know, for the person that, is a, uh, you know, that gives his life in jihad you know, will have 72 virgins. That, that's, that's earthly pleasure. We don't have earthly pleasure in heaven. We have something better than earthly pleasure in heaven. So with the gospel, you know, it's possible to go from where we are to where He is, to put aside what we are and become what He is. 
in the heavenly vision, I go back to Isaiah, he was purified by a, a hot coal. It says that the angel went and got a hot coal from the altar there and, and touched his lips and purified his lips. Uh, because why? Because God was calling Isaiah to go on a special mission to become his spokesman. And Isaiah realized, I, I can't do that. I, I'm a man of unclean lips. You know? And so a coal is taken and placed on his lips and he's told, your, your lips are now purified. And so now, now Isaiah, you know, God says, you know, who shall we send? And now Isaiah, after the lips have been purified, now Isaiah stands and said, here I am, Lord, send me. But before the lips were purified, he wasn't able to say that. He wasn't even able to speak. All he could do was acknowledge that he was a sinner. In other words, what am I doing here? <laughs> I don't belong here. It's like me, you know, what am I doing in a foursome with Tiger Woods? You know, I don't belong here. Well, that, that was Isaiah's, I don't belong here. Now in the New Testament, another image is used to purify the hearts and the lives of those who want to remain in the presence and in the service of a holy and pure God. And that is through the cleansing water of baptism. The imagery of the hot coal is now accomplished through the imagery of baptism. So those who wish to know God, to be like God, they begin by confessing their faith in Christ, repenting of their sins. And isn't that what Isaiah did? He saw what he saw and what did he do? He said, I, I'm a man of unclean lips. You know, he acknowledged, I'm not worthy, I'm a sinner. Now it's interesting that Isaiah would say, I'm a man of unclean lips from a, a, a people, because Isaiah was a very educated man. And he, had, you know, he, 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 he was a leader in his community. He came from an aristocratic family. He had all the advantages. In human terms, he was at the top of the scale, the top of the social ladder next to the king. But when he comes before God, what does he acknowledge? I'm nothing, I'm just a sinner. Well, in the same way, when we come to the waters of baptism, what do we say? I'm nothing, I'm just a sinner, that's who I am. And so those who wish to know God, to be like God, begin by confessing their faith in Christ, repenting of their sins and being immersed in the water of baptism to wash away all the impurities of the soul. And at that point, the individual can say, you know, God is saying, who, who, who's going to come to me? Who's going to be like me? And because we've been washed clean, all of us can say, here I am, Lord. Here I am. Call me. Bring me forward. I can come. So all those who need to come closer to the holy God, that's the place to begin. And I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here in our, in our classroom, but you need to remember the very important significance of baptism, the very important significance of this first step as you call others to come and be like, and be like God. All right, so we're going to stop there for today, move on with this lesson about getting to know God more perfectly as we continue. That's our lesson, thank you.